Mr. Speaker, prior to coming to Congress two years ago, I spent 15 years building manufacturing companies. I've been personally on the receiving end of bad trade policy and bad trade practices. So in 2016, when President, then candidate Trump, now President Trump, talked about making America great again by dealing with bad trade deals and bad trade practices, uh, frankly, he energized me and many other people in my industry, in the manufacturing sector, and indeed all across the country, because America has lived with bad consequences of bad trade deals. In fact, uh, America has built its history on trade. Uh, truly, economic liberty is as much a part of America's history as religious liberty uh, and other forms of liberty. We were the world's largest trading country. We are a, a, a great trading power in every way you can measure it. We do have trade deficits with some countries, but we have to pay attention to the right metrics. So when we talk about bad trade practices and bad trade policies, we talk about, uh, to use an analogy, watching basketball. Think how the sport would change if there were no fouls called and no one could shoot free throws. These are the kinds of things that happen with the WTO. Eventually, after sometimes years of filing a complaint, the WTO will adjudicate uh, a, a, a subsidy practice by China on steel, for example, and then they'll say, hey, you have to stop. Well, the moment a, a, a complaint is filed, the Chinese company just dumps faster because they know that it's going to be turned off. The trouble is there's no consequence for this bad conduct. And so what I had hoped we would be doing is we would be using our great relationships around the world to unite our allies, our best trading partners, frankly, people that are also the victims of these bad trade practices and bad trade policies to take action against those bad practices so that we could define what is a foul and what is the effective free throw. What are the consequences? I believe that the president's great goals are being poorly served by some of his advisors. And I hope that the president will change course because what we're doing has resulted in failure in every type of war studied from Sun Tzu through World War II through more modern wars. When you multiply your enemies, you're not winning. And we are doing that with the practices that uh, some of the administration are implementing, things that implement uniform tariffs, things that distort the very definition of a national security issue to call German luxury autos a national security issue. We have tools in the kit bag that could be very effective, tools like sanctions. When we engage in warfare, um, when we engage with enemies of our country that are strategic enemies. We have sanctions in, in place against Russia, sanctions in place against Iran, and sanctions in place against North Korea. The beauty of sanctions is they can be targeted not just at a country or a sector, they can be targeted to companies and even individuals. We can use these things to restrict the flow and we can define what is illicit finance. We could use these tools that the world uses already against bad actors, and frankly, some of the worst actors in the world, to unite our allies and to define a better way uh, for trade going forward. So we shouldn't confuse this with uh, a critique of the objective. The objective is indeed noble and necessary. Past trade practices, past presidential policies have left America um, on the short end. True, as Milton Friedman said, if countries want to subsidize the cost of a good, uh, let them. They're just lowering the cost for our consumers. But we can't simply be a nation of consumers. We need people to put capital at risk in America, to thrive, and for our great industries, whether it's agriculture or manufacturing or technology, for the intellectual property to flourish here. We have the best markets for goods, services, intellectual property, capital. And we need to make sure that we defend that. And I applaud President Trump for being passionate about putting America first in these practices. But I do believe that we need to look at the tactics that have been employed by many who have advised him and say, is this multiplying our enemies? And in fact, it is. I hope we can move forward in a better way and we can serve this great country uh, by restoring trade to its right and proper place as a vibrant part of our economy. Exports drive our economy, but imports can benefit our economy. 
Trade is exactly that. Trade is something of value for both parties. Both profit when trade is there. A zero-sum understanding is not the right way to look at trade. We benefit, and so do others. And it's okay that they benefit because then they're able to buy more from us and trade. The practices that are in place today give us a chance to assess um, the progress. And I think it's vital that we do that. It's vital that we keep this economy doing the great things that it has under President Trump's leadership, under congressional leadership. We were told that the new normal was a 1.5% growth rate, that we couldn't grow at the high rate. With regulatory relief and tax reform, our economy is growing higher than 3%. And we certainly want to do, don't want to do anything that would derail that momentum. And I'm encouraged uh, by the dialogue tonight. Mr. Hill, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And I know we have other colleagues that would like to as well, and I yield. I thank my friend uh, from Ohio. He's a, a valued member of the House Financial Services Committee, and his uh,